Well, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Louis Matam from, from RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, I work as part of an interdisciplinary conservation science group, which is part of this um, Australia government-funded hub called the Clean Air and Urban Landscapes Hub. So we're starting a citizen science program as part of this, and I'm really excited to be here today and sharing part of the work that we're doing there. Now, but before I start, I thought I could do like a little sort of like icebreaker interactive activity. And I want to ask you guys, you guys in the audience, if you could help me uh, answer this question. So have you ever been on a whale or a bird watching tour? Great. Oh, everyone, great. So it doesn't have to be only whale, it could be, you know, like uh, dolphins or, you know, aurora borealis, whatever, polar bears. So could you please share that with the person sitting next to you? Which one is the one that you got, you got more excited about or like the recent one or something that kind of comes to mind? Give you like 30 seconds to share that. Great, great, thanks. <laughs> cool. So, like, like keeping keeping your uh, your tour in mind, I think you all agree that what probably made that trip exciting, that tour exciting, is that you actually got to see what you went out to see, right? Yeah, that's that's you know, otherwise it would have been terrible. And that is exactly what like the aim, the broad aim of the research that I want to do. I want to be able, with my colleagues, to give the people the opportunity to see insect pollination in action. So basically be able to go into a green space or go into the gardens and be able to see the pollinators pollinating. And so I'm going to you know, describe a little bit how we think we could go about that. And so the first thing and probably the hardest thing is that appreciating the benefits of pollination, right, requires that people actually feel pollinators as something tangible, as something visible. This is, this is quite difficult as you can imagine. And there's at least two good reasons for that. Compared to whales, compared to dolphins, even our largest pollinators, like our largest Australian butterflies, are tiny in comparison, right? And not only that, they're very, very fast. So how are we going to solve that problem? How are we going to make people appreciate pollination when we have these fast, tiny, moving animals? And what we think we can do, and, and hopefully uh, some of you will agree, is to anchor our research and actually on the flower. So if we could make people pay attention to flowers long enough until the pollinator comes along and make that connection, that's what we're after. And so as you can see and as you can imagine now here, we're not, we're not after trying to find a given animal, we're trying to find an interaction, which is a slightly different approach. And so the idea we have to bring this about is called pollinator observatories, which is basically a network of flowering plants in a given location that people can go to to actually try to make, take the time to observe the flower and make the connection with the pollinators. Okay, so this is an example in Westgate Park in Melbourne. And what you see here, I hope I can point with, with the mouse, is the pollinator observatory. So this area here with the running postman plant flower. It's real red flowers here. And so what we hope is to monitor these observatories using both academic but also citizen science. And I'm just going to talk about the citizen science part today. As you can see here in this example, this is the pollinator observatory and this golden wattle in flower. And here's a group of about 10, 12 citizen science, all observing pollinators at the same time, collecting the same kind of standardized data. But here my colleague Holly uh, is doing the more sort of academic-led researchers, research, sorry, where we do things like sweep netting and like more thorough direct observations. And this, of course, as you can imagine, will help us validate the data that we are collecting, which I think is a critical step in citizen science. So the next two slides are just to show you two examples, two groups that we're actually working with to make this happen. The first one is called the Friends of Westgate Park, which is a community group. And they have this beautiful program called Providing for Pollinators. So they've been doing like they only, um, they're a brilliant group. They restored a rubbish tip into a, a park that I think if any one of you were to be there today, you would think it's a remnant patch. 
when in fact it's basically just a beautiful curated garden throughout the years. And so now they want to promote pollinators. And here is another example of a pollinator observatory. The banks here, they're taking observations. Um, there's two really cool stories at this slide that I might, might share with you. One of them is that when this project started, my first son was also being born, and I wasn't sure how it was going to work, being out in the field and everything, so I was really happy to learn that here's my wife and my son, that could, they could share this experience with me and they could be out there doing the observations as well. Uh, and the second one is, as this citizen science here, um, when we were doing the training module, the training uh, sort of exercise that happened before this, going out into the field, I was asked whether um, we should include, like we had done training with bees and butterflies, we didn't include wasps at that time. And so someone asked me, uh, what about the European wasp? Why is it not included? Doesn't it go to flowers? And it made me think, well, I've never seen it on a flower, right? Never, ever. So I'm going to stay with the idea that a wasp, a European wasp, is just a scavenger and it doesn't pollinate. And then effectively, as you would imagine, our colleague here in the red striped shirt, he found the European wasp actually interacting strongly with the banksia. So there you go, you know, that was an immediate citizen science outcome that you know, next time we did the training, we obviously include the story and the European wasp as a potential pollinator. The, the next group we collaborate with is the Earth, Earthwatch Institute, and they have a brilliant pro program called Scientists for a Day. And I think Karen referred to this type of activity this morning as a corporate volunteer type program. So what they do is that some corporations, some firms, uh, kind of like encourage their, their, um, their employees to take a day off or half a day off and do some kind of like citizen science-led activity. So this is the kind of program we're running with them. And this one takes place, for example, in the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. And we're running different activities across Australia, so re uh, next it will be Brisbane in a couple of weeks. Now, a little bit about the training, what we think is key in this, in this, in this experience. What we actually do is provide sort of like a one-hour workshop before the citizen science go out into the field to record the data, do the monitoring of the observatories. And we do things like this. We, we really try to bring the species close to them by talking about them, by showing them photos, by highlighting some of their attributes and their morphologies. And then after that, so we go over about 12, 15 species, and then we do a little certification model. It's like a little quiz where we ask him about, you know, photos, can you recognize the species, and we try to all learn together. It's really dynamic. And we're also about to, uh, like, sort of supplement this workshop activities that we do with, uh, with an app. So the Clean Air and Urban Landscape Hub is about to launch what they call the Urban Wildlife App. And as you can see here, we'll have different components. I'll just refer back to the beneficial insect ones, where then if you are doing this actually in the field, then it's really easy to use. You can click in one of these options, say example bees, and then that will bring up this window where you can choose, for example, have you seen a blue banded bee or a honey bee or, or another type of bee. Now, um, I don't, don't want to lose you here in this last one. I hear that if you include things like like a typical myth, if you include an equation or something, you might lose, lose your whole audience. I'm trying to have a little, uh, this little interactive graph here, and I'll try to do my best to explain it to you, see, see if we can all come along this one. So in this plot, we're actually plotting uh, the way that our data will look like, and data that we actually use to run analysis with the data that citizen science and the academic people are collecting. And it's called a network. So it's a network approach. I think Karen referred to this a little bit this morning with social science data. Um, this will be in case it's a plant pollinator interaction network. So you have, for example, let's say here in green, you have a whole suite of native plants here in green. And all the red ones are exotic plants, as you might expect to find in a botanic garden, for example. And then here on the right, you have your different pollinators including things that are non-native or exotic, like the honeybee in purple, and then in blue, your native pollinators. And I think you can clearly see how we can learn about what is interacting with what, whom is, who is interacting with whom, and the strength of that interaction. Right? So for example, here native bees are strongly interacting with a whole range of native and non-native plants. And you can imagine that this will help managers eventually 
learn what kind of plants, what kind of observatories they need to put in place for people to come to specific uh, plant uh, insect pollinators. But basically, what we really want to do is to then enable with time, as we build up this network, is to be able to, for managers of park, to share this with potential users of the park. And so they can point out to someone coming to the park where they can go see a given pollinator in action, right? And my final example, and this I will finish, is this is a sort of like an endangered plant species, at least for the region of Melbourne, pig face. And this is a very rare butterfly to spot in urban environments. And now we know that around October, for example, the butterfly is definitely attracted to the pollinator observatory. So the park managers in Westcote Park are going to use this information to be able to point out to the users, go see the butterfly in this observatory in this time of the year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Louis.